push it on a little bit. Push it on. Yeah, okay. I have one hour, no? Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll talk fast. Um, good morning. Maying uh, buntag sa inyong tanan din haya. Wassalamualaikum and magandang umaga. Um, first of all, I wish to thank... I don't have PowerPoint. I lost it. So, first of all, I wish to thank Christina Juan and the SOAS Philippine Studies Program for inviting me here. I was not actually sure if I had something worthy to share with you. After all, in the last five years uh, or so, several young scholars have come out with exceptional works that have, in a way, superseded what I've written. Let me mention a few. Uh, in Ateneo de Manila University's History Department, Patricia Dakudao, who wrote a Murdoch dissertation at Murdoch University on the socio-economic and cultural transformation of Frontier Davao from 1898 to 1941, which wherein she has corrected much of Making Mindanao, the book I wrote, while broadening the focus of Professor Shinzo Hayase of Wasida University's work on Japanese and Okinawans in colonial Davao. Pat, Pat's book, I think, is coming out with Ateneo, the Manila University Press. Oliver Charbonneau. Oliver is... Ah, oh, there he is. Okay. Oliver just was just hired by the University of Glasgow to teach U.S. foreign policy, huh? right? Yeah. And his book, uh, Civilizational Imperatives, Americans, Moros, and the Colonial World, will be coming out of Cornell University Press in the fall? Uh, next year. Ne oh, next year. Okay. Uh, then there is Anthony Medrano, uh, who, who studied under Alfred McCoy, who's, this is really fascinating. He's, he's the title of his dissertation is Following Fish, Science, Industry, and the Asian Marine Environment from 1822 to 1941, where he has a couple of chapters in the tuna, tuna industry in southern Mindanao, and its history in what he called the protein boom that fed and fueled the rise of urban society, plantation agriculture, and imperial expansion in the interwar period. Anthony's book, I think, is coming out with Harvard University Press. Then a few months ago, I met Alisa Paredes at Yale University, who is completing her dissertation on plantation agriculture and the making of the Philippine-Japan trade. Uh, she has quietly put back political economy in the discussion of Mindanao studies. She's fluent in Tagalog, English, and Japanese, and her project uh, is to look at the new connections between East and Southeast Asia through sweet banana. So the Japanese have discovered sweet banana, you know, uh, Michiko-san. And so she's studying the connections between that uh, from uh, communities on, in Mount Apo up to uh, shopping, uh, shopping centers in Japan. Then finally, while he was a few years younger than me at the University of the Philippines, uh, Francisco Lara's decision to enter grad school at SOAS, a decade uh, after decades as a communist cadre, uh, has led to the production, uh, publication of Insurgents, Class and States, Political Legitimacy and Resurgent Conflict in Muslim Mindanao Philippines. It's the first ever comparative study on the relationship between strongman rule, the Islamic rebellion, and Mindanao's illicit economy. Um, Pancho now hits international alert and has formed a multi-talented research Mindanao base research a field work centered and researchers academic and NGO researchers that produce out of the shadows violent conflict and the real economy of Mindanao an edited volume based on various key studies of illicit trade in Mindanao from castle wrestling to gun smuggling both books were published by Ateneo Press then we have our Japanese scholars in who are working in Mindanao Two weeks ago, I was in a conference of young scholars in the Philippines in Nagoya, where we came out with a preliminary list of 178 Japanese faculty, graduate students, and independent researchers working on the Philippines, the biggest, lar the largest group globally. Okay? Uh, Twelve of these are working on Mindanao. now. We have Taniguchi San, who is an expert on the, it takes sides, no? Moro Islamic Liberation Front and the Moro National Liberation Front. She goes to Mindanao frequently. And we have Midori Sensei. She is not our expert on Nana. So that said, though, so you know, I feel really relevant. Although that said, I may be able to add. Uh, I think I may be able to add to these exceptional scholars, uh, perhaps as a last hurrah, you know, by this old fart whose works become antique and archive ready. So let me continue with this uh, sort of uh, this organized speech by citing a couple of contradictions about Mindanao. The first is geography. So we often refer to Mindanao as the second largest island of the archipelago. But in its land area of 37,675 square miles, it is far bigger than Ireland, Austria, 
Slovakia, Estonia, Denmark, and the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Okay? In Southeast Asia, it's larger than Taiwan, East Timor, and Singapore. Singapore is like 278.6 square miles only. And if you put it alongside the difference, the 50 states of the American Union, it is far larger than 13 other states. Okay? So the island is the eighth most populous island in the world with a total population of 21.5. Yet if you think about how much has been written about these countries and these states, and you put them alongside the literature of Mindanao, the discrepancy is quite palpable. Second, because of President Duterte and Islamic terrorism, Mindanao has become the most discussed conflict ridden region in the country. It is all, it, it, it's also the least accessible as a subject of study. Global and Manila anxieties have prompted governments and families to prohibit or strongly warn their children scholars to go to this turbulent frontier. Fulbright, for example, does not allow students to go down after Cebu. A student who was studying, working on the Okinawans in Davao, and he said, I'm going to go to Davao. No. So Fulbright said, no, he can't. So as a result, we still know very little about the Moro Rebellion that T.J.H. George, Tom McKenna, Martins Vitog, and Glenda Gloria, and Taniguchi-san and her colleague from Osaka University, Masako Ishii, have written about. The problem with Taniguchi-san and Masako-san's uh, uh, dissertations is written in Japanese, so hopefully she'll <laughs> translate it soon. But two topics, I think, cry out when it comes to the MNLF Rebellion. First is that the Islam Muslim Separatist Group's international connection notably in the 60s with Al-Azhar University, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan in the 1980s, and all throughout the decades, Malaysia's intimate relationship within the more National Liberation Front and more Islamic Liberation Front. One of these imams I interviewed in General Santos was this guy who was uprooted from his village in the middle of the night and said, do not open your mouth, we're going to Sabah. You be Bachao, so you're not Indonesian. Then another, he was then transported from Sandakan to Kuala Lumpur. And the next day, he was on the flight to Pakistan. Then the day after, from Pakistan, he lands in Tripoli, Libya, with five, I think, ten other Muslim, Philippine Muslims, driven into a desert camp, okay, and then made to stand and was given initial training by East German military specialist in anti-tank warfare. With international, with the Irish Republican Army, the Tamil, the Tamil Tigers, the Southeast, uh, Southern Thailand uh, separatist movement, uh, there's another group. And this guy was just uprooted out of nowhere. Uh, he came back, but then his leaders stole the money. So he stayed a while in Sandakan for 10 years before he was able to come back and become an imam. Um, when I was doing research in 2008 in the war zones, uh, the American USAID was building a mosque. And the funny thing is, when the American anthem is played, everybody stands up. When the Philippine anthem plays, everybody, the Muslim students sit down. And you ask, why do you do this? Where did you get education? They would mention oh, Afghanistan. Yeah. But murmuring, okay? But again, resistance is not, however, exclusive to the Muslims. Up until the split in the 1990s, the Communist Party of the Philippines, its largest and fastest growing regional organization, was the Mindanao Commission. It had a particularly idiosyncratic leadership, consisting mainly of cadres, Carl, correct me on this, okay? It's called not on Mao Chiatong, but on Gustavo Gutierrez's theology of liberation. In fact, the commission's uh, United Front Committee was composed of nuns and priests, and many of its legal apparatuses were church-based. Its leaders were very experimental and prone to military experiments, uh, which was despised by the national leadership. But Mindanao, the uh, Mindanao Commission was oldest a site where 800 of the communist cadres were killed and tortured 19, from starting in 1987. There were victims of an internal purge that came out of the fear and paranoia of military infiltration. The story of the commission remains unwritten, made more difficult by academic leftists back home saying that what the current party leadership describes as the deviation of the Mindanao Commission is the real truth. This is unfortunate because at the University of Philippines Archives, you have I think eight microfilms of primary documents on the Mindanao Commission. Nobody has ever explored it yet. Um, I was able, somebody helped me, donated his boxes to UP and then we microfilmed it and sent it back. So it's ready for research. 
There's also initial studies on anti-Muslim, anti-communist militia groups, especially after the fall of Marcos. But the problem is they're all leader-centered. So we have glimpses of Norberto, Norberto Romanero, the guy who killed uh, the Italian priest, the Ilagos of South Cotabato, uh, my favorite uh, uh, militia, uh, anti, anti-Muslim militia, Feliciano Luces, alias Commander Toothwick, and his brother, Commander Toothbrush who you know, operate in the borders of Lano del Sur. He's dead now, but he say, they say his spirit goes around. And then, of course, the Parohinog family from my own hometown, uh, who used to run the dreaded militia come syndicate Coratong Galiling, uh, the mayor was killed last year, which used to run the heroin and illegal Vietnamese uh, import, uh, rice imports in the 1980s and 1990s. So we have very few journalistic pieces about them, and therefore we need more research. The other armed group, actually, that scholars of Mindanao have ignored is the Philippine military. After he declared martial law, Marcos sent over 70% of the army to Mindanao to quell the MNF rebellion. They were all in the 18, 19 year olds. This was the second conventional war that the country suffered. And its consequences on Mindanao have been deep. So we're not only talking of devastations of villages and towns, the displacement of people, but also the encounters of community for the first time with the national state. The image of the national state for many of these communities was not the teacher, but it was a soldier shooting at them. But also, ironically, the Mindanao War was created the first signs of national integration. Muslims were uh, displaced from the, the communities, ending up in different cities and towns in Central and North Philippines. And so now you have like 40 mosques in Manila alone. And you know, and the Maranao is running this wonderful illegal uh, trade um, from from yeah, from Tawi Tawi to Baguio. Okay, the other thing is the round colonels. If you remember Gringo Hanasan and his uh, crazy colonels who tried to overthrow Marcos and Aquino, earned their spurs as lieutenants during this war. They hit brutalities on the Muslims, but also refined okay, torture techniques that they learned from the CIA during that war. They were politicized by that war and eventually thought that they could become caudillos and try to overthrow President Marcos in 86 and Mrs. Aquino from 86 to 89. The war also helps explain, and I think there's a panel on the 30th, the likes of the Ampatuan family uh, and Rodrigo Duterte. So there's a panel later, we we'll love looking forward to what they say. So we are aware of these changes, but we have to prove their, their origins and resilience. The third area is political economy. So historians on colonial economy like Professor Hayazi and Pat Takuda have studied the hemp plantation in Okinawa. Mike Hawkins, uh, who at Creighton University has studied the moral exchanges under American rule. And in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, AFRIM, an NGO in Davao, people like Carl, uh, were studying the impact of land use, export crops, timber, and the fishing industries on the economy, and the role of Japanese and American capital in it. Um, the impulse behind the latter was the, this, this research was the Marcos de- developed dictatorship's frenetic drive to open the island. I remember for the first time, there was cement roads in 1974, 73, crossing across Lano del Sur. But also, but then the kind of research that was focused here was developmental because if you say politics during the Marcos era, you get arrested. So as Marcos made a speech about the third world, so everybody tapped on it to do research on the banana industries, the fishing industries, and the pineapple industries in Davao. Um, it has fallen in the wayside in 1986. Ironically, at a time when Davos natural, uh, Mindanao's natural resources have been ramped, exploitation of its resources have been ramped up. Uh, fishing, you know, bukidnon's um, uh, pineapple, but also a lot of veg- vegetables. Um, and there's a sign, but there's a sign of revival on political economy, albeit on the illicit side. You're thinking of Pancho Lara's studies, uh, in fact. So, so these contradictions. You know, have yet to be explained. And I think it must have something to do with the fact, the unconscious bias we have towards the island. So we treat Denmark, Ireland, Singapore as national states with complex histories, but Mindanao is only a region of the Philippines. In fact, one professor in Australia referred to it condescendingly as a province. So the island is just always treated as local and not a center of its own to borrow a phrase from the famous historian of pre-colonial Southeast Asia, 
Oliver Walters. So in a way, we really know very little about Mindanaoans even today. Now, in one of our drinking sessions, Ben Anderson once wondered why political scientists do not write funny things. You know, an example, laughter was always there in many a Filipino political writing. Just recall the tremendous amounts of funny stuff you can find in Rizal's novels and in the essays of Nick Joaquin. So as a result, I have shifted and shifted after making Mindanao. My attention to studying two, two areas in Mindanao, which I think was it would be funny, but also uh, might have implications in the advance of the uh, Mindanao studies. One is the rat, you know, the gut, the rats uh, in Mindanao, which in 1950s was a scourge that almost caused a lot of famine all over Mindanao. And the other one is on smuggling. Okay, I grew up with smuggling. My, my mother had a favorite smuggler who would bring uh, Singaporean bananas, Cadbury chocolates, uh, what's the other one? Uh, oh, the Belgian rifle, uh, which my brother then sells, used to sell. Okay. Um, so I'll tell you, I can tell you later the rats, but what I'd like to do today is to sort of use the smuggling story by asking this hypothetical question that I once asked in 2014 to graduate students in a workshop at the Atene University, and then in 2017 to members of the Philippine Political Science Association in Cebu. So I never received any good answer from them. So maybe this group will be able to yield something different. So here goes my hypothetical question, okay? So what would Philippine history look like if you encounter a Muslim woman with the last name of Tan, okay? Sitting in a hut in Sangyasap, Sangyasapu Island at the northern tip of Tawi-Tawi province. Baitan is sorting out knocked up iPhones and blackberries. They, they, they're called blueberries uh, in, in Sangwanga. From South China, Malong from Indonesia, five-in-one coffee sachets from Malaysia, and copies of the digitized version of the famous Japanese porn film Ichiju's Wet Lust and bullets from the Public National Car Carabine, the Belgian rifle stolen from the Indonesian army. Now she's doing this while watching reruns of her favorite Indonesian drama, Love in Paris, featuring the hunk Dima Zangara. On a rewired Japanese-made TV, she bought cheaply from a Filipino crew of a Panamanian-owned cargo ship passing through the area. Occasionally, she glances at her cell phone, expecting a WhatsApp call okay, from her Cebuano husband, who is arranging the transport of the smuggled goods in Sambuanga, to stand for a, an underground shop in Kiapo Church. You know, Kiapo, it's under Kiapo Church, all the things you can buy there, and also assassins. Um, um, she is also waiting for a text from her Saudi-based husband, Saudi Arabia-based daughter, who will tell her mother how much she will remit to the Banco de Oro branch in Tawi-Tawi, and she hopes to get the text at 1 p.m. because past that time, the current shifts and she takes her motorized banca. And if she takes her motorized banca, then she will most likely end up in Bukaan, Gorontalo province, northern Sulawesi. So here he is a citizen, a felon by livelihood, a Filipina cedula holder, whose mental load is national. Sangashapo, Sambuanga, Manila, but also global, Northern Sulawesi, Saudi Arabia, Panamanian cargo ship, Japanese television and porn, Indonesian telenovelas, Malaysian coffee, Indonesian malong, Southern China, and most surely Singapore. She is Muslim, but comfortable with marketing the most Islamic of goods, uh, uh, you know, Japanese pornography. The, if you interview some of these Maranaos in Green Hills and ask them their favorite pornographic movies, they would always say, uh, Japanese, of course. And they would say, well, because there's a, there's a story. Before the sex, there's a story. Okay. <laughs> Americans, it's just straight to sex, and then Filipinos just go see the movie theater in Kiapo, and you'll watch it. But Japanese uh, professor, there's a, there's a story. Boy meets girl, girl meets with the park, they complain about their parents, and then they have sex. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> then, you know, try to interview these Marana women in Green Hills, they're so funny. Um, so she lives in the edge of a national territory, Tangashapu Island is an, east, an islet east of Tawi Tawi, a very beautiful island. An area which the state with government leaders regard with trepidation because this is where the political order is at most intense and the national state is at its weakest. But Baitan is Moro and Chinese. She's a spawn of two minority groups that people in the center mistrust 
Recall, for example, the racist rants of the national artist F. Chanel Jose against the Chinese. And in the 2004 Filipino Human Development Report survey, 48% of Filipinos still believe Muslims are terrorists and go amok. So how would you place her in that narrative? First, as a woman, she may be challenging to study. Feminist, feminist politics back home focus mainly on the open struggle of women activists, movements, and organizations. But the subtle everyday forms of female resistance and its hidden transcripts are still unwritten, prompting, for example, a professor at the College University of the Philippines to complain that when General Leonard Wood noted that the best leaders in the Philippines were not the likes of Quezon or Sospeña, but they were the women he encountered, Professor Fernandez said, if this is true, how come women in the Philippines are invisible in history books? Um, historian Maya Lourdes Carmagay was aware of this defect and appealed to fellow historians to look for data in iconographic evidence such as pictures, literature, diaries, letters, and those that are derived from oral history. Um, but here's the problem, okay? Uh, the problem really is perhaps women prefer to be in the background because they don't want to show their power. Uh, among Muslims, for example, Vivian Angeles, uh, who teaches at the University at, at Pennsylvania, uh, wrote a piece on Desdemona Maswari, the first wife of Norm Maswari, who, and she spoke about her quiet influence in the formation of the MNLF chairman's ideas. And to go back further, there was a wonderful uh, uh, data I found in the U.S. archives about the U.S. District Officer Lieutenant Colonel Sidney Cloban, who was watching in awe as Princess Piando nagged her husband, the Sultan of Sulu, to wear a termite ravaged tuxedo when facing the Americans, because this is how they dressed up when trading in Singapore. Then there was by Piando's niece, the American educated Tarhata Kiram, very wonderful who married the strongman Datu Tahil Lidazan then convinced her husband to lead an uprising against the Americans, which of course failed. Uh, but it has been praised by historians as another evidence of moral resistance, but in, in fact, the real story was that uh, uh, Karhata Kiram fell in love with another person and wanted to get rid of Datu Lidazan, so he said, you know, go revolt and go to jail, and I'm going to marry Datu Buyongan after that. Now, way back in 2008, while I was hanging out in South Cotabato with Muslim feminist scholar Rufa Giam and, and her former MNF guerrilla friends, I was like Cloman, enthralled by the description of their, of, this command, of their commander husbands as fools, whose only talent was to assemble and dismantle and fire their weapons, while they, the wives, raised family, ran the business, and were the real administrators of local government and offices. They were more than happy, however, to let their husbands be the public face of the rebellion and the darlings of local and international press. Because they know, both of them, and even their husband know, and the audience know, that she, they have, they, where their power, uh, power lies. Uh, if you're familiar with Clan Wars Rido, for example, Ridos are resolved not by the husbands, but by the wives. So the biggest violation that the Ampatuan massacre did was the Ampatuan killing the wife of Mangundadato and therefore violating an unstated law of family, how family clans fight together. And the rumor was when um, Ampatuan asked, how can we repay that? Uh, Mangundadato said, ah, you have to kill three of your boys. Yeah. Uh, that didn't happen. Okay. Now, by then, however, she's also more, she's not a woman, she's also a moral. So when you factor in this ethnic identity and figure out its relationship to national politics, this will inevitably bring out the rebellion of the MNLF and the MILF. Uh, there's a lot of literature on it, but largely underappreciated and rallying parallel to this is this why we are resilient belief, Oliver probably can talk about it more, that Americans had consistently been the moral friend and ally. Historians are right in reminding us that Americans wage a bloody war against the Muslims. However, they made very little of the fact that after peace was established, the American soldiers also became the Moros public school teachers, as well as the dogged defenders against the forced integration by Filipinos. Uh, their datus ended up compromising with the colonial state and its Republican successors, but communities remained nostalgic of the days of what they called the Melicans. What kept this foundness for the colonizer alive was the failure, of course, of the national state to establish legitimacy through a well-run public education system. The reason, for example, why I wrote Making Mindanao was 
uh, I was interviewing a 91 year old man in in Wau, Lano del Sur, and when her when his granddaughter said, "Oh, this is Jojo Pinales. He's America, and you know he's from Osami City, and he wants to study the rebellion." And the grand, the old man said, "What? A slave? Because we science a slave, okay? For in the eyes of what was that? a slave in America. What is a slave doing in America?" But 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 the the, the last line stumped the last question stumped me because he said, "Well, when is General Leonard Wood coming back to save us from the Filipinos?" So he was six years old when the Americans promised, "If Leonard Wood becomes president, we're gonna come back, to separate America, Mindanao, and to and integrate it to Guam." So it's this fun this that even people, people like, like Michael Hawkins realized that in interviews in Lanao, he had a dad to say, hey, when will we become the 51st state of the Union? So this failure to erase American popular colonial rule from the popular berry helps explain such peculiar moves in the 1930 Dan Salan Declaration of Maranao Datus appealing to the U.S. to separate Mindanao before the establishment of the Commonwealth. Or the MNLF's active the demand that the United States Agency for International Development be involved in the post-war rehabilitation of Mindanao. And then and there is the enduring letter, the worried letter from MILF chairman Hasim Salamat to George W. Bush, asking the Americans to be the fellow mediators with the Malaysians in reviving the peace process with the Ramos government. And of course, there, is, uh, there was the survey in 2000 when American troops started coming back in Lanao, in, 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 in Mindanao, 60% of Muslims said yes. Uh, so there's something that has to be understood still. Yeah? So, but then the war is really just a small part of Baitan's life uh, because she was really uh, you know, very much a smuggler. In the eyes again of the nation state, she's a criminal who is a member of an underground trading network that subverts the national political economy. Okay? It, for the economy, it, it, because the commodities she sells are untaxed and cheaper compared to the legal high price taxable uh, products of their competitors. Uh, one of the funny things when you go to some Wanga barter trade is when they realize you're an old guy, say, hey, professor, we have Viagra from China. <laughs> like, no, I can't buy that. <laughs> like, but we tested it. Like, why? Who did you test it? Oh, with the American soldiers there. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> so, so, like, um, so, and the illicit sector today constitutes 50% of our gross domestic product. Okay. The store rumor is you, you cannot run for political office if you, if you do not have 40% of your budget paid for and funded by gun dealers, smugglers, number of operators. And in fact, I found a document that says between 1960 and 2011, over a 52-year time span, the cumulative financial flows of smuggled communities and monies into and out of the Philippines totaled 410 billion, making the Philippines the sixth largest exporter of illicit capital from the developing nations. And in fact, Al McCoy, when he wrote uh, <clears throat> uh, policing America's uh, empire is a very interesting book because he's saying, well, you know, the real history of the Philippines is all these criminals running it. Um, now, adding theft to a smuggler's power is a realm that cuts across several nation states. It covers a swath of land and sea from maritime to mainland Southeast Asia to southern China to Japan or even as far as Vladivostok. This is the world of Baitan, a sprawling zone that has a history longer than that of the nation state. The smugglers of today belong to a long line of merchants that go back as far as the pre-colonial period. They are thoroughly familiar with their terrain, their forefathers crisscross trading routes across the region where the authority of charismatic, pugnacious, and business savvy strongmen and strong women, okay, wax and wane according to their ability to trade. So recall, for example, that in the colonial era, the colonial era began not with the British, the Dutch, and the Spanish armies conquering Southeast Asia. In fact, Colonialism was an attempt by these Europeans to tap and insert themselves in this maritime trading network, initially as minor players, sometimes with fatal results, as the case of Magellan in Mactan. The British did, not, uh, did this too in Malaya, setting up a trading arrangement in the early years with the sultans of Johor and Perak before they started to make more, uh, take more and more state-like formations uh, with the feather states of Malaya. Now, this contrast then gives you an idea of how their political thinking is quite palpable and different from that of Manila. So in the islands of Sulu, for example, it is said that for most part of the year, 
the families imagine themselves as Malaysians, the Malaysian nationals. And the only day they become Filipinos is when their dad will say, hey, you have to vote. And then they switch back to their, Malay, uh, their Malaysian nationalities. And then uh, how then would this perspective... Uh, uh, so, so that's another problem. So finally, Bai Tan's lineage is also Chinese. She's the descendant of a Chinese merchant who settled in Holo in the eve of the colonial era. And those of you familiar with Sulu uh, Muslim trading history, it is one of the popular arrangements that uh, strong men in port cities like the, uh, Hulu did was for the Chinese traders to deposit one of their members in, in the town so that he would be the guarantee that the guys would come back. Most often, he gets married to the daughter of the Sultan of Sulu and becomes the, prime, uh, becomes the financial advisor of the Sultan. So think of Datu Piang's uh, father who was Chinese and who was apparently his father's finance minister. They become members of the son-in-law and become members of the Council of Advisors and therefore are bestowed some authority by the Sultan as part of the royal family. Their mestizo children and later on grandchildren and great-grandchildren continue this role as their mediators between trading partners. Their position strengthening because of their being Muslim and Chinese. So if there's one reason why Chinese are not kidnapped in Mindanao, it's because of this. The, the local elites of Tawi Tawi and Holo are last names are Tan. Uh, uh, the other, uh, Amer the other uh, group that's not kidnapped are the Americans and the Ilocanos, which I come to them later. Okay? So laying out this contradiction and describing this imaginary story of a Muslim Chinese smuggler is one thing, but doing the research to find which explanation has the most substantive empirical grounding is another thing. Mindanao is not only a hard place to conduct research, but its people also do not readily open themselves to the prying eyes of outsiders. The war, of course, is a major obstacle with people dead and displaced, documents burned and displaced, long-term field work arduous and dangerous. Uh, but the pers and then the persistence of small arms terrorism by the Abu Sayyaf and other groups also make it less likely for many researchers to come for information across the war zones. Um, yet it is not actually impossible, as Pancho Lara, a sociologist, uh, his colleagues in, in the International Alert, had, uh, Jamel Kamian is a historian, uh, Kiam is an anthropologist, uh, Ketieras and Ketorian or Actis have done. Vito and Gloria were able to do that too. So did Medrano and Paredes. But there is also the fact that this anti-center sentiment in the, has, in the last decade seemed to spread to even the prime agents of integration in Mindanao, the settlers. Now, it, today, it's not only Muslims anymore who complain of the exploitation from the north. Children and grandchildren of Christian migrants, my friends from Davao, have similarly appropriated the term Imperial Manila to define their position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the country. Now, why this sentiment has persisted despite, say, the nationalization of Tagalog? Everybody speaks Tagalog now. Even the kidnappers speak Tagalog. Uh, it's, it's, like, it's very one of the ironies in the national language spread is the war on kidnapping. Uh, because in part, actually, one, top, one group of uh, Mindanaoans that have not been studied are the settler communities. Nobody's have studied them. Okay. That dip. Okay. So, but finally, what I think keeps Mindanao difficult to study is its people's cosmopolitanism. If you go to Tawi Tawi and hang out there for a couple of weeks, you will notice that the world, Baitan's world is, a liter is literally a Tower of Babel. But unlike where the people in this periphery understand each other quite well. People who live in the fringes, i.e. Mindanao, are polyglot by nature, switching languages and identities with ease in a trading zone where being multilingual is the norm. So a lot of the smugglers, for example, can just switch to Bahasa Melayo, Bahasa Indonesian, Hokkien, and then Bisayan, Tagalog, a little English. Okay? On a given day, in places like Basilan and Tawi-Tawi, one can actually hear people effortlessly conversing in Bahasa Malaysia, Bahasa Indonesia, Bisayan, Tagalog, Tausug, Hokkien, Maguindanao, occasionally Maranao because of the north, some Arabic, and a little English. This is a place difficult to monitor because the, sp sp the spice of the state only learned two languages, English and Tagalog. And, uh, and this is where I think those of us who sincerely want to study Mindanao and also Sulu 
may want to seriously consider, and that is to understand that it, to studying Mindanao entails the, in a many ways trying to understand how Mindanaoans talk to each other and address the outside world. We have to get into their heads, as it were, to under, this, under memories, ideas of nationhood and community, politics, their everyday lives, and where they hope their children would be in the near future. To study Mindanao is to privilege area studies once again. For to do so, it distinguishes us from scholars who see the island only as a step to tenure and promotion, and those who study the island and its people because of our love for it. Thank you. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. I don't mind. I don't mind. Yeah, we, yes. have we have a little bit of time. Yes. And uh, I'm uh, very pleased of the uh, emphasis on smuggling because, as I always <laughs> tell, tell my students, people see uh, frontiers as a terrible imposition, but actually they're a wonderful resource. No frontiers, no smuggling. <laughs> so, no training. We <laughs> well, you can have trade, but smuggling is the state calls it smuggling. <laughs> yes. Right. Would anyone like to kick off with any particular questions? At the back there, yes. It's more like how you act, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it can be done, actually. Uh, if you're familiar with one or three languages, you can see yeah, easier. So, uh, there are certain areas, of course, that you cannot go beyond the meetan because the apples they have. But the other thing is, if you have sponsors, they will protect you. You going there? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to. <laughs> it's a fun place. Yes. Well, the, the crony, the, the warlords that are close to the national government are the ones running the drug trade. And this government actually has continued, you know, its connection to this. A lot of the smugglers actually do not involve in that, except guns, okay? Uh, they're very much involved in trading. Um, like, there were 14,000 former Moro National Liberation for guerrillas that shifted to, uh, you know, the, the U.S. funded their uh, economic livelihood projects. They're more interested in the market for the market now in China. It was a trade uh, exchange trade. They rarely go into drugs because of their children. Um, so there is that group that, you know, that tries to prevent, it's like the godfather in part one. For, they like to prevent drugs from coming in. The only problem is with the creation of methamphetamines, you cannot move your production site from Hong Kong to Marawi. And it's easier to make and extremely profitable. You can earn, what, 2,000 pesos in five hours with meth. So that's a big fight now. Uh, there's a big draw on kids, you know, uh, to just participate in that network rather than do the traditional. Um, I don't know what will happen mm. unless these warlords are killed. <laughs> Carl Gaspar from Ateneo. I was like a college student when he was Carl Gaspar. <laughs> <laughs> I have no questions, but a number of comments on some of the points you raised. But I, I was very delighted at how you ended your paper because that too is our advocacy in the now. Especially today, there seems to be a lot of interest on in the now, but uh, you have like people flying from all over the place. Uh, Mindanao peoples themselves are not able to really benefit from all that research that's being conducted in Mindanao. And there's some efforts at 
this particular time to try to do something about that because there's a lot of interest within Mindanao from the Madras schools to the Lumad schools to the universities to really expand on Mindanao studies. So thank you, Jojo, for getting that talk. But there are four points I'd like to raise. Number one, certainly there's, there should be a lot of interest regarding the Mindanao Commission under the CPPNA because it has a very distinct history in relation to the overall national and even until today it continues to that kind of a dynamic and yet it is very difficult to really enter into it. I'm glad to know that there's been this development to make those materials ready. And the time to do that is now when some of the key people are still alive and are, are willing to really share. No, but as you know there are also a lot of visitation yeah. because the current situation political situation in the Philippines can also still create a lot of risk for researchers to move to this area because it can be easily misunderstood within the Duterte regime regarding where your loyalties, your interests, and your engagements are. Related to that, the second point is specifically what you said regarding the role of priests, seminarians, lands, pastors, now the Christian left yeah. political landscape. Uh, which certainly played a very important role. As you know, Kit Collier began that study and there's been very little by way of trying to expand on what he began and there should be an interest. But again, because of the very risky situation in which you are in right now, it's also quite difficult, not just in relation to the state, but in relation to the institutional church. Because the irony in Mindanao Church today is the progressive element within the institutional church has really retreated into very conservative mode. And yet, ironically, the very same institutional church is very supportive of the Moro people's struggle, at least in terms of the BOL arm, because mm -hmm. the bishops, our own director in our university, have come out very openly in support of that. And yet, when it comes to the other struggle, rebellion, revolutionary agenda that for some people is even more legitimate for the entire Mindanao, uh, there would be a very strong hesitation. Third, precisely in that particular terrain, uh, the challenge for research is also very urgent for the moment because in regard to the no one seeing, you know, uh, I teach anthropology of peace and development in the university and we try to expand our outreach in the whole discourse of revolts, rebellion, revolutions, and so on. And the counters to that, as you mentioned, from Tupic all the way to, uh, you know, your area where you have the Grand Duke of and so on. Uh, the late Arlinda Burton of Xavier University tried to do something at least in terms of the visual exhibit at the Museo de Oro. I hope it's still there. There's a whole section of all the symbols that were used by the anti-communist cult or social movements, complete with all the cloth that they have produced and the, the signs and symbols and so on, which was their way to provoke scholars to move into this particular area. Unfortunately, I, I do not even know what student interested to pursue uh, the entire study, which I think is very important because it expands the whole element of millenarianism which brings you to the point what you raised, that we, we did try to scan the literature of Mindanao uh, as of pre-conquest until today. And the prevalence of research is still primarily dealing with the Moro and the Roman communities. So there's a very, very uh, uh, adequate uh, lack of interest to pursue studies with migrant centers, their descendants. And, and yet the construct of Mindanao identity today no longer cannot ignore the fact that what, uh, two generations already of descendants of migrant settlers have, have lived there and considered Mindanao their homeland. And yet the research is not able to move in that particular direction. All this, I think, <laughs> creates all these challenges, you know, but for the moment, in fact, our problem is there's very little resources available. Chen and Deng are, are promoting a lot of interest in Milano studies, but you know where, where funds are concerned, there's very little. And within the local resources, of course, even Afrin, for the moment, as you know, was the major research, uh, especially
especially in terms of the political economy of Mindanao. There's just one stock memory there, and all the papers you mentioned, there's a danger of it vanishing in the wind. No, they're in Cornell. Money. They're in Cornell University. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. Anyway, thank yeah. you. Well, two things, Carl. One is uh, the Mindanao Commission stories in 2005, me, a couple of us interviewed uh, veterans of the first quarter storm, the first generation of this. And the only way they would open up is to say, well, this you're going to tell our story. We're not going to tell you. We're not going to publish it. We're telling this, this is for your grandchildren. And they opened up. So we have about 50 interviews, like two hour interviews, very depressing, uh, and transcribed. Uh, you just have to ask permission from this, some these people who, who pray, some some are dead, for example, the family, if you're willing to, uh, if they'd be willing to come out to publish the transcription. It's at UP University of Philippines now. Each of us has a copy. The second one is the Mindanao Commission. There's like a, a friend of ours in Davao, apparently was the uh, the librarian of. The nice thing about Filipino communists is they were products from the University of the Philippines. So they were conscious about history. So whatever they write, they send, they send it to the library or they send it to somebody. So they, this guy, this professor at the Nehru Dava, has these five boxes of primary documents and the Mindanao Commission some had written. He's agreed the DUP to transcribe, to microfilm it. Initially he said, ah, I don't want you to read it. And then he realized, ah, it's history. So it's available now at the University of the Philippines. And I think I have a copy if you're interested. It's a large file. I'd be happy to share with you. The third one is the 2008 Mindanao Anthology that Albert Alejo and several others have published. Apparently, they don't know where the CD is now. But I have, I have, I painfully, that was my first paper actually to look at this anthology. But it's so long, it's like so long. I, I'm finishing the section on history and culture, and typing it down. And those of you who are interested, I'd be happy to share the data. It's all these PhD dissertations, research, MA thesis, articles, written by Mindanaoans in Mindanao. So if you ask yourself, what do Mindanaoans read? It's very fascinating. I got curious of it because my mother's MA thesis was there. Like, uh, a study of music, piano lessons, and like, what the heck is my mother doing here? Uh, and then my an ex-girlfriend was there too, yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> uh, and, you know, the study, uh, she was a, a teach public school teacher. So, I have, I'm almost finished with it, and if you're interested, I'd be happy to share it with you. Just send me your email. Uh, the third thing is the settlement zone. Uh, Rachel, Reyes. Rachel. No, she's not here yet. I said, yeah. She's having like something, something on the third day. Uh, that might be the start. Uh, uh, the biggest problem really is this, it, it, a lot of it is oral. And in the U.S., you can't do oral because you have to ask the permission of the interviewee to sign it and say, I smuggler so-and-so approved this. <laughs> yeah. like a uh, and so that, 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 because a lot of the newspapers have burned down or, are, as they put it, recycled. We send it to the Chinese for recycling. So the center stories actually have to be mainly oral. The, the one I, I discovered, the Ilagas, in, south, in, in southern Cotabato, because these guys were at the back. And, 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 the, and the Sanjay said, hey, I have a church. Like, what? What were you? And they had, they had a church, and they had the Ilagas, and they were father of, you know, uh, of Manero. Uh, and, and that's how I discovered it. And, and, and you really have to go to the field. The imam I discovered was just you know, with Kufa hanging around uh, you know, the market. So... The, so it's really difficult to study, but there are already sources, and those of you who are interested in working on it, I have some of them. I'd be happy to share it with you so that you can write about it. I'm too old. I want to study rats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we haven't had a question about rats yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jonathan Saha is studying rats in Burma. Really? Yes. So if you want to have a productive talk. <laughs> okay. yeah. I mean, it, it, it actually defined the uh, ecology of Mindanao. Yeah. It's very important. Right, uh, non-rat questions? <laughs> <laughs> or have we... Yes? I, uh, I am contacted. Um, my name is Georgi, and I've been working for the last uh, six years in Mindanao. Not kidnapped yet, but I'm going back. German, huh? <laughs> yeah, but our track record is... Yeah, with Chico. My track record, our track record is not that great because of some of them went missing, unfortunately. And, well, it didn't end good, but what I wanted to ask you, like, uh, since you mentioned the contradictions in the very beginning of the talk, um, 
based on now a few months of the PTA in place, and as a long-standing expert and scholar, and even now, do you feel more positive about the future, or do you perceive already some early warning signs, so to speak, that you might feel that essentially history will repeat itself? You can answer. <laughs> But I think the more Islamic liberation front learned from the more national liberation front that for you to be able to take over as a state, uh, as a gover governing, you have to have skilled people. The MNL did not have that. So the Japanese government, uh, I think NEDA and the Malaysian government, have before the BTA have been working with the MILF, training their cadres on basics like how to do accounting, no? Yeah. How to prepare reports. And they're very serious about it, which makes them different from the MLF. The MLF really are more pragmatic. So there's a hope for that. The big problem is what to do with the private armies. No? The MLF has 14,000 strong army. Will it go after private armies? It's complicated by the fact because of Rido, where everybody's you know, official titles are overlapping on the name of the base of the family. But I think it can also be done. Uh, uh, I mean, there were zones of peace, I think, that were established in 1996, 97. Maybe Carl later can talk about it on what the status is. But there were eerie efforts to do that. <coughs> the fifth thing is really interesting. Uh, I've been studying the USAID project in, in, in the now. And unlike the Germans and the Japanese, when you demobilize army, you take their arms away. The Americans kept the arms. It's, it's, that, it's that arms to farms, it's farms with arms. <laughs> because the state was weak, the police were weak. The only way in which these uh, livelihood projects of the MNLF could protect itself was to allow it to keep their arms. And so one of the fascinating things when I was doing research on this, that if you read USAID reports in Washington DC, it's really bland and boring. It's like uh, human resources. Uh, because, and this is what you know, localization has done. Because the first revenues of this livelihood project, a thousand dollars, MLF recipients, MLF recipients of the aid project, do four things. One is they buy a new boat or a new motorcycle. In the U.S. IAD report in Washington D.C., it says new equipment. <laughs> the second thing, they buy a new gun. And, in a, and, they, and thank God for the U.S. Army there, because after every military exercises, general exercises, the U.S. Army leaves its guns with the Filipinos, and the Filipinos sell it to them. And in the U.S. AID report in D.C., it's new equipment. The third thing is they connect, I think it's, it's over now, but they connect illegally with Indonesian TV, Global TV, so all this, uh, you know, you, you see the use in Sandakan, but you have all these, ch these channels, you know, uh, to direct to the world. And their argument was that we need our kids to be to learn about the world. The fourth one is human resources. If you read it in Washington DC, but it's actually to get a new wife because you're allowed four wives in Islam. So that sort of thing, that the uh, part of the reason why it's successful is this gray very grayness approach that the Americans have used, okay? Uh, we will raise, we will donate uh, 20 computers, your PTA, you form a PTA and match that. We don't care where the money comes from, comes from smuggling. You can use your arms. And in Tawi Tawi, for example, there's wonderful two towers. We have machine guns guarding a 1,000 marine safety zone. That, and this where got the, the Americans built the tower, the machine guns were that of them and the left to protect water zone. So that, this that grayness, I think, that can be the source of optimism. I mean, Mindanao is all gray, no? It's really gray. <laughs> no, no black and white there. Yes?
moving to 21st too because in Sandakan, there's a section in Sandakan where it's all Moro National Liberation Front guerrillas who never went back. And they've really settled their fam family there. There's a journalist uh, I met last in Japan who actually studies it. But nobody has studied it from that perspective. So you might want to do that and go to Saba. You know. yeah. I've been to Saba. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can give you the name of the journalist. <laughs> well, oh, a rock, quick last question, yes. So that connection now has to be cut. And I think, you know, Japan knows it. The Germans know it. You guys have fantastic intelligence agencies there running around. So <laughs> you know who to hit. You know, you know whose guns have to be. And, and yeah, and, and that's the only answer I can give. Otherwise, it's all speculation. This political power comes from the barrel of the gun as well. No man can run faster than a bullet from a gun, yeah. <laughs> as Idi Amin said. Well, on that rather uh, unfortunate note, perhaps, no, 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 no. Uh, we can <laughs> now thank, you, thank our speaker uh, very much yeah. for a very stimulating talk. Uh, and we're breaking for coffee, which is just outside. Excellent. And uh, please be back promptly, um, because our next session starts at 10.30. Uh, on the, what Elsa has asked for, looking back in time. The, the, the one